Thank you all. I'd just like to remind you before I um, make a start that uh, you do need to have your microphones on mute. I think we've tried to reach everybody from this end, uh, but just in case that fails, uh, please make sure your microphones are on mute. Thank you for joining us today. In recognition of the deep history and culture of this island of Tasmania, Lutruwita, we acknowledge all Tasmanian Aboriginal <coughs> We acknowledge all Tasmanian Aboriginal communities as custodians of this land and recognise their continuing connection to land, sea, waterways and sky, and acknowledge that they have survived invasion and dispossession and continue to maintain their identity, culture and Aboriginal rights. We pay our respects to Elders, past, present and emerging, and particularly also to the Aboriginal people attending today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jenny Gale, Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet and Head of the, State, the Tasmanian State Service. Today, in celebration of International Women's Day, we come together to recognise and celebrate the achievements of women in the Tasmanian State Service, the community services industry and local government for their outstanding contributions. We have six cross-sector award categories to celebrate today. They are Inspirational and Inspiring Leader of the Tasmanian State Service, Inspirational Leader and Aspiring Leader in our Community Services Industry, and Inspirational Leader Elected Representative and Inspirational Leader Officer in Local Government. I would like to take a moment to thank uh, and welcome you all. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to welcome and thank the people um, who are here behind me, our sponsor for the event, TASPLAN, soon to be Spirit Super, uh, who, are represented, who is represented here today by Kathleen Crawford, Chief Operating Officer of TASPLAN. My fellow judges, Adrian Picconi from TASCOS, Adrian, and Dion Lester from the Local Government Association of Tasmania, and Leanne Hurst from Local Government Professionals Association Australia and Gary Arnold is here today from Kingborough Council to represent um, that association. And of course we welcome, although you won't be able to see her yet um, on screen, uh, Grace Tame, our 2021 Australian of the Year and keynote speaker. I would also like to acknowledge um, the Honourable Sarah Courtney MP, Minister for Women, who unfortunately can't be here today, but sends her best wishes and congratulations to all finalists. As you all, there, all no doubt know, International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women, while also marking a call to action for accelerating gender balance. The theme for International Women's Day in 2021 is Choose to Challenge. A theme that recognises from challenge comes change. That individually we are all responsible for our own thoughts and actions, all day, every day. And that we can all choose to challenge and call out gender bias and inequality. We can all choose to seek out and celebrate women's achievements. And collectively, we can all help create a more inclusive world. Now, um, we won't be using the chat function today, so just a couple of technical things. Um, we won't be using the chat function today or taking questions during the event. However, you are welcome to use the emoticons, if you know how to do that, <laughs> to express messages of congratulations, thanks or support throughout today's proceedings. Um, at the time when we needed to make a decision about how this event would be conducted because of COVID, we weren't certain that we'd be able to um, go ahead in our usual format, and therefore that's why we've moved uh, to our online format today. I'm getting it here. Hopefully for this year only. Um, so I do thank you all for your interest in attending virtually today. We have a significant number attending, which we're really pleased with. Um, we were a bit concerned about how the online format might turn out in terms of interest. And we're really grateful that you've shown that interest today to help us to celebrate women's achievements across the sectors. Um, we will be recording today's event um, and we'll make it available across our sectors for those not able to attend. So should you wish, you may turn your camera off. Uh, although, of course, for everybody, it's a much richer experience if we can see you um, and interact at least uh, face to face, um, if only virtually. 
To our finalists, when we announce the winner of each category, we will invite you to say a few words. So to support us in finding you, we would very much appreciate if you could use the raise hand function, that very technical thing, um, and, uh, and then we will be able to um, zoom in on you um, uh, and uh, assist you to say a few words to the audience. Uh, obviously, you would need to unmute um, your uh, microphone uh, and then remember to remute once you've remute once you've finished. So it is now my absolutely great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Grace Tame. Grace is an advocate for survivors of sexual assault uh, who has demonstrated extraordinary courage, uh, using her voice to push for legal reform and raise public awareness about the impacts of sexual violence. On the 25th of January this year, I'm sure you all know that Grace was recognised as the 2021 Australian of the Year at the Australian of the Year Awards, the first Tasmanian to ever receive this honour in the 61 year history of the awards. Um, I heard Ita, Ita Buttrose, one of Australia's most notable women this morning on the radio, refer to the 2021 Australian of the Year as that remarkable Tasmanian Grace Tame. So we're incredibly fortunate, Grace, that for what has been a whirlwind of activity ever since that you are with us here today um, to provide our keynote address. And I do note um, that Grace is an absolutely loyal Tasmanian and she's travelled from Canberra this morning to be here today and she's going back to Sydney tomorrow for a United Nations address. So Grace, thank you so much for coming and we very much look forward to hearing you speaking. Welcome. Well, thank you, Jenny, for that um, very, very lovely introduction and hello to everyone. Um, fair warning, you may want to familiarise yourself with that emoticon button um, <laughs> for what I'm about to dive into. Uh, this year's International Women's Day theme could not be more fitting, choosing to challenge. Recently, as Jenny explained, I was awarded for my advocacy in an area deemed too challenging to even speak about. I encourage you all to join me in choosing to challenge this notion because doing so is the only way forward. Most of you already know my story, but let me take you back a little further. In April of 2010, I was battling anorexia, and truth be told, I still am. This illness had nearly taken my life the year prior and seen me hospitalised twice, bedridden and tube fed, deemed on the verge of heart failure. Bone thin, I was picked on for the way that I looked. I'd just stopped living with my father for the first time since I was born, and my mother was eight months pregnant at 45. I was a 15-year-old student. One morning, <laughs> one morning after an outpatient checkup, I arrived late on campus to discover the rest of my year 10 classmates were attending a driving lesson off campus that I'd completely forgotten about. Lapses like these weren't uncommon at this time because I was barely there. One of the senior teachers at my school noticed me walking around aimlessly in the courtyard. He was well respected, the head of maths and science, at the school for nearly 20 years. He'd taught me in year nine and I thought he was funny. He told me he had a free period and asked if I'd come and chat with him in his office. He asked me about my illness. I talked, he listened. He promised to help me to guide me in my recovery. He gave me a key to his office where there was always music playing and it was always the same music, Simon and Garfunkel. Over a period of months, he built my trust to a point where I felt safe sharing my fears and past trauma that underpinned my illness, like my experience of being sexually abused as a six-year-old by an older child who told me to undress in a closet before molesting me. He told me he would never hurt me until he did by way of a masterful reenactment I didn't see coming with a closet and an instruction to undress. Most of you know my story from there. That is how I lost my virginity to a 58 year old pedophile and spent the next six months being raped by him at school nearly every day on the floor of his office. It was a mere four months after the abuse stopped that I reported to him, him to police. They found 28 multimedia files of child pornography on his computer. But 
as per the lasting impact of intense and manipulative grooming, I effectively defended him in my statement. Still only 16 then, I was terrified that he would find out and that he would kill me. He was sentenced to two years and 10 months in jail for maintaining a sexual relationship with a person under the age of 17. Now, repairing myself in the aftermath of all of this was certainly not a simple linear challenge. For every step forward, there were steps back to the side and some almost off the edge. I saw counselor after counselor, but I also abused drugs. I drank, I moved overseas, cut myself, threw myself into study, dyed my hair, made amazing friends, got ugly tattoos, worked for my childhood hero, found myself in violent relationships, practiced yoga, I even became a yoga teacher. I starved, I binged, and I starved again. One of the toughest challenges on my road to recovery was trying to speak about something we are taught is unspeakable. I felt completely disconnected from myself and from everyone around me. Many people didn't know how to respond. That said, the ones who listened, the ones who were eager to understand even when they couldn't, made all the difference. But still, the doubt lingered. How could I have been so stupid as to not see what this man was doing from the outset? Was it my fault? Should I have known it was a lie when he said he'd learned more from me than any of his other students? Maybe I should have been more alarmed when he asked me if I knew where my clitoris was and then laughed at me when I said no. It was when he was released after serving only 19 months for abusing me almost every day, correction, maintaining a sexual relationship with me as a 15 year old, and then spoke freely on Facebook and to the media about how awesome and enviable it was that I realized we had this all around the wrong way. Add the fact that this man was awarded a federally funded PhD scholarship to Utah's while my mother was studying there. My mother, who hadn't had the opportunity to do so growing up. She soon dropped out because of his presence, but he remained. In fact, he was put into James Fisher College with fresh 17 and 18 year old undergraduates. And despite multiple reports to police by fellow students of his predatory behavior, and despite once again being convicted and jailed for his vulgar public comments during his PhD tenure, he was eventually awarded a doctorate. After all this, it became quite obvious to me why child sexual abuse remains ubiquitous in our society. Because while predators retain the power to get exactly what they want, to feign remorse and to objectify their targets unchallenged, it's the innocent, survivors and bystanders alike, who are burdened by shame-induced silence. In 2017, I reached out to groundbreaking freelance journalist and my dear friend, Nina Fennell, with a view to share my story publicly under my own name to raise awareness and educate others about the prolonged psychological manipulation that belies it. Yet, after months of recounting re-traumatizing details and tirelessly transposed by Nina, we discovered we were barred from sharing them by Section 194K of Tasmania's Evidence Act, which made it illegal for survivors of child sexual abuse to be identified in the media, even as adults, even with their consent. So using my case as a foundation, Nina created the Let Her Speak campaign to reform this law. We were then joined by 16 other brave survivors who lent their stories to the cause as well. The law was officially changed in April of last year almost 10 years to the day since the beginning of my story. It is so important for our nation, for the whole world in fact, to listen to survivors' stories. Whilst they are challenging to hear, the reality of what goes on behind closed doors is more so. And the more details we omit for fear of disturbance, the more we soften these crimes, the more we shield perpetrators from the shame that is resultantly misdirected towards their targets. When we share, we heal, we reconnect and we grow, both as individuals and as a united collective. It's history, lived experience, the whole truth, unsanitized and unedited, that is our greatest learning resource. It is what informs so social and structural change. The upshot of allowing predators a voice, but not survivors, is what encourages their criminal behavior. Through working with Nina, 
and finally winning the right to speak and talking with fellow campaign survivors and countless other women and men who have since come forward, it has become clear that there is the potential to do so much more to support survivors to thrive in life beyond their trauma and more so to end child sexual abuse. It is my mission to do so and it begins right now. As a fortunate nation, we have a particular obligation to protect our most vulnerable, our innocent children, and especially those who face further challenges due to circumstance, being part of a minority group or geographical location. It's now time to challenge the status quo with how we deal with child sexual abuse. And these are three key areas that we can focus on to achieve this. Number one, how we invite, listen and accept the conversation and lived experiences of survivors of sexual abuse. You've heard me say it before, it all starts with conversation. Number two, what we do to constructively challenge and expand our understanding of this heinous crime, in particular the grooming process, through both formal and informal education. Number three, how we provide a consistent national framework that supports survivors and their loved ones, not just in their recovery, but also with policies that disempower and deter predators from action. So what is it that we must do? First and foremost, let's keep talking about it. It's that simple. Let's start by opening up. It is up to us as a community, as a country, to create a space, a national movement where survivors feel supported and free to share their truths. So let's drive a paradigm shift of shame away from those who have been abused and onto abusive behaviour. Let's share the platform to remind all survivors that their individual voice matters amongst the collective. Every story is imbued with unique, catalytic, educative potential that can only be told by its subject. So let's listen genuinely, actively, without judgment and without advice to demonstrate empathy and reassure that it is and never was our fault. There is a difference between interrogation and listening to inquire and learn from our experience. We are all human beings and as such, we build connection through communication. On average, it takes 23.9 years for survivors of child sexual abuse to be able to speak about their experiences. Such is the success of predators at instilling fear and self-doubt in the minds of their targets. More so than they are masters of destroying our trust in others, perpetrators are masters of destroying our trust in our own judgment, in ourselves. Such is the power of shame. A power, though, that is no match for love. When I disclosed my abuse to another of my teachers, Dr. William Simon, his absolute belief in me was the only assurance I needed to tell police. It helped me recover a little of my lost faith in humanity. There isn't a single rigid solution. Solutions will naturally come in due course by allowing and enabling voices to be heard. Certainly, talking about child sexual abuse won't eradicate it, but we can't fix a problem we don't discuss. And so it begins with conversation. From there, we need to expand the conversation in order to create more awareness and education, particularly around the process of grooming. Grooming, it's a concept that makes us shudder, and as such, we rarely hear about it, to the benefit of predators. While it haunts us and we avoid properly breaking it down, the complexity and secrecy of this criminal behavior is what predators thrive on. In turn, we enable them to charm and manipulate not just their targets, but all of us at once, family, friends, colleagues, and community members. And this must stop. Our discomfort, our fear, and the resulting ignorance needs to stop giving perpetrators the protection, power, and confidence that allows them to operate. Choose to challenge the fear, discomfort, and ignorance. As a start, we should all be aware of what have been identified as the six phases of grooming, which certainly ring true in my experience. Number one is targeting, that is, identifying a vulnerable individual. In my case, I was an innocent child. I was also anorexic with significant change happening at home. Number two is gaining trust, that is, 
establishing a friendship and falsely lulling the target into a sense of security by empathizing and assuring safety. For me, that was what I thought was listening to my challenges, empathizing with my situation and providing me with a safe space when I needed it. Number three is filling a need. That is playing the person that fills the gap in the target's mental or emotional support. In my case, Although I was surrounded by an incredibly attentive family and team of medical professionals, most of their support came in the form of tough love. The teacher thus assumed the role of sympathizer, telling me everything I wanted to hear. Number four is isolating. That is, driving wedges between the target and their genuine supporters. This involves pushing certain people away, but exploiting others. I remember studying the film Iron Jawed Angels that year in history. It's about the suffragettes. In one of the scenes, the main character is force fed, much like I had been. Aware of my distress upon seeing this, my history teacher quietly led me out of the classroom. And although I said nothing, she took me straight to his office, where she left me with him, panicked in tears. It wasn't until many years later that I questioned why she and other staff would take me to him when I was upset. Staff he privately mocked and referred to as the Menopausal Virgins Club. Did he tell them to do so? He must have done. Number five is sexualizing. That is gradually introducing sexual content so as to normalize it. You've heard of the frog in boiling water analogy. This really applies here. In my case, in conjunction with explicit conversation, I was carefully exposed to material that glorified relationships between characters with significant age differences. There was one particular film he made me watch called The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, the last line of which is, give me a girl at an impressionable age and she is mine for life. And remember how I said Simon and Garfunkel was always playing? Their music was the soundtrack to The Graduate, of course. He made me watch that too. And thus, both literally and figuratively, it was the sound of silence, haunting and unending, that underscored my experience of pedophilic abuse. You know the lyrics. The vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. And number six is maintaining control. That is, striking a perfect balance between causing pain and also providing relief from that pain to condition the target to feel guilt at the thought of exposing a person who also appears to care for them. By way of physical intimidation combined with veiled threats, abusers scare you into silent submission. At over six foot, he towered above me. He once told me a story about a friend of his who sought revenge on a woman by digging her eyes out with a spoon. He told me he'd killed people as a soldier. He'd also sit outside on my street at night in his car to watch me undress through the window. I was already embarrassed by my changing shape as a young teenager in eating disorder recovery. I remember standing naked behind his desk after he had just raped me on the floor and asking him if he thought I was fat. He looked me up and down and said, well, you could do with some more exercise like I was a dog, but he also told me I was beautiful. See how it's all stifling, stiflingly, painfully complex. But as we talk more about sexual abuse, our lived experiences and what we know, our understanding of this premeditated evil will continue to develop. We need to warn our children, age appropriately, of course, of the signs and characteristic behaviors, whilst educating how to report it, should it happen to them, or to those around them. And finally, we need structural change. We need to challenge our current national systems in pursuit of ones that support and protect survivors and deal with crimes in proportion to their severity. Furthermore, we need to consider the implications of linguistics in, related to, in relation to offences. Through Let Her Speak, we saw the wording of my abuser's charge officially changed here in Tasmania from maintaining a sexual relationship with a person under the age of 17 to the persistent sexual abuse of a child. Think about the difference in the crime according to the, to the language of both of these. Think about the message it sends to the community. 
Think about the message it sends to survivors, where empathy is placed, where blame is placed and how punishment is then given. Since I was announced as Australian of the Year just over a month ago, hundreds of fellow child sexual abuse survivors have reached out to me to tell their stories, to cry with me. Stories they thought they would take with them to their grave out of shame for being subjected to something that wasn't their fault. Stories of a kind of suffering they had previously never been able to explain. Stories of grooming. I am one of the luckiest ones who survived, who is believed and surrounded by love. And what this shows me is that despite this problem still existing and despite a personal history of trauma that is still ongoing, it is possible to heal, to thrive, and to live a wonderful life. It is my mission, therefore, and my duty as a survivor and as a survivor with a voice to continue working towards eradicating child sexual abuse. I won't stop until it does. And I invite you all to join me in choosing this challenge. Through facing challenges, we not only learn and progress, we strengthen our bonds as human beings, united in the struggle, regardless of the outcome. And that in of itself is a positive outcome. Truly, a challenge we commit to face together as one is not really a challenge at all. It is a triumph of love over hate. Thank you. Grace, thanks so much for um, being prepared to share your story with us again today. And I think for all of us, painting a future that sees um, significant change um, in this area and for you to be the voice of that um, is going to be, um, uh, I think, um, great for us to watch, but also to join you in making sure we get the change we need to ensure that our most vulnerable um, people, our children, are protected. So thank you so much um, for that and best wishes for the rest of your um, uh, your uh, tour um, and, and uh, for the rest of the year. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I would now like to introduce to you um, Christina Holmdahl, Mayor of West Tamer Council and President of the Local Government Association of Tasmania, to speak further about the awards and to introduce our event sponsor. Um, and I should, um, probably just before Christina comes to join us, um, I should just say that if anything um, that has been part of the presentation today has caused distress for any people, please make sure that you reach out for the, to the appropriate um, support organisations who can help you. Um, so with that, thank you, Christina. <coughs> Thank you very much, Jenny, and good afternoon, everybody. And it's lovely to welcome you as well to today's um, meeting and occasion. Um, I am the Mayor of the West Tamer Council and I am the President of LEGAT, or the Local Government Association of Tasmania. LEGAT is a peak body for local government in Tasmania and our key role is to represent, support and advocate on behalf of the 29 councils for the benefit of the Tasmanian community. It's my pleasure to commence today's proceedings for our 2021 TASPLAN International Women's Day Awards for Excellence. This is the third year that we've held this occasion and run these awards, bringing together three sectors, the Tasmanian State Service, Community Service Sector, and my sector, Local Government. And we're here to showcase and celebrate women in Tasmania who are making outstanding contributions for all Tasmanians. And as previously mentioned, the International Women's Day campaign theme for 2021 is Choose to Challenge. And a challenged world is an alert world and all of us can choose to challenge and to call out gender bias and inequity and we can also choose to seek out and celebrate women's achievements, which is why we're all here today. By amplifying the achievements of women in Tasmania, we are more likely to ensure diversity of thought in problem solving to improve outcomes across economic, health and social issues. 
I am now pleased to welcome Kathleen Crawford from TASPLAN and as mentioned previously, soon to be known as Spirit Super, who is our award sponsor today. Kathleen is responsible for the day-to-day -day operation activities of TASPLAN, encompassing all member and employer functions that include financial planning, corporate and member IT systems, member administration and marketing, CAV has extensive management experience in Tasmanian financial service industry and joined TASPLAN from RBF. And I think you'll all agree from that very quick bio of Kathleen, she's yet another high performing and high achieving Tasmanian woman. So Kath, it's over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to join you to celebrate these deserving um, women um, for these excellence awards, all recipients and nominees. On the 1st of April, TASPLAN will, um, sorry, my notes are a bit strange at the moment. Um, on the 1st of April, TASPLAN will merge with MTAA Super to become Spirit Super. As Spirit Super, we will have greater capacity to improve our products and services. And as Chief Operations Officer of Spirit Super, I'm really pleased to be with you here today. The TASPLAN International Women's Day Awards for Excellence are a way for us to bring people together to recognise and to give visibility to the outstanding contributions by women in local government, the Tasmanian State Service and the community sector. This year's International Women's Day theme, Choose to Challenge, is a great one. And we're asking all of you here today to help us challenge the gender pay gap. Statistically, women are more likely to be on lower income earners and are likely to retire with 47% less super than their male counterparts. And if you were one of the women who needed to withdraw $20,000 through the early release scheme of super for COVID-19 to be able to support you and your family, that has the potential uh, to result in $120,000 less in your pocket at retirement. I choose to challenge each of you to take stock of your situation to ensure your super is working as hard as you are. Enjoy the day as we celebrate these wonderful women achievers. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the Tasmanian State Service Inspirational and Aspiring Leader Award categories. For me, International Women's Day is an opportunity to reflect on not only my own pathway to leadership, but more broadly on what more we need to do uh, whilst acknowledging how far we've come. I started my career in the early 70s when the feminist movement was in full swing, but still, almost 50 years later, we are setting targets for female leadership in the Tasmanian State Service. For me, it's a relevant reminder that in 2016, when I became head of agency for the Department of Education, I was the first female appointed in a permanent capacity to that role in 2016. Uh, similarly, I believe when I became head of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, I'm the only second, only the second female to hold that role. And as a sign of change, I guess, I'm proud that although the head of the state service role has only been in existence since about 2013, um, I'm the first and hopefully by no means the last uh, woman to hold that position. So the Tasmanian State Service is committed to the development and retention of high performing female leaders and it's my privilege as head of the state service uh, to lead the service that has close to 50% now of our senior executive service being women. My aspiration is that state service leadership ultimately reflects the proportion of women who are employed in the state service, which currently stands at approximately 70% of the service. So we still do have some way to go. These awards provide an important platform to recognise and acknowledge the outstanding work of our female leaders in the state service. I now invite Kathleen to announce the winner of the 2021 Tasmanian State Service Inspirational Leader Award. The winner of the TASPLAN International Women's Day Award for Excellence 2021 for Inspirational Leadership in the Tasmanian State Service is Sophie Muller. 
So if his policy advice and expertise as part of the state government's COVID-19 coordination centre have been instrumental in controlling the COVID infections in Tasmania and preventing the Tasmanian public and protecting, sorry, the Tasmanian public, business and industry. Her strategic policy input to, into the broader controls and the range of public health measures have made an enormous contribution to Tasmania's achievement in responding to the COVID-19 threat. Sophie inspires those who work with her by always providing clear direction and purpose for her team. Congratulations, Sophie. You should be right to go. Sorry. Yes, I can hear you. And that was me well, on that rarely COVID occasion saying, you're on mute, Jenny. Sorry, Sophie. <laughs> and hopefully we'll be able to hear you as well. Sophie? Sophie, sorry. I think you may be on mute. The screen. Uh, sorry about that, Jenny. Um, sorry, having a few technical difficulties here, but I just want to. Say thank you to the remarkable group of people that I have been working with in the last 12 months in the um, State Control Centre and now the COVID Coordination Centre um, who have really um, been a professional and wonderful group of people to work with um, as we've really steered the state through some unprecedented times and I think part of the thing that's contributed to our leadership through this time has been um, a leadership that has welcomed those in the team daring to challenge. So we've had some really robust um, public policy conversations in the last year and that's been very much welcomed by the leadership under Commissioner Hine and Deputy Commissioner Tilliard. So it's been um, a, a terrific team to be part of in the last 12 months. So thank you. Congratulations, Sophie, and um, thoroughly well deserved. Uh, and I need to declare there that I had a conflict of interest with some of the nominees for that uh, award, uh, and so I removed myself from the um, from the judging for that because um, Sophie and I had worked uh, before she went up to the State Control Centre quite closely. So I just wanted to put that on record. But congratulations, Sophie, thoroughly um, deserved. I'll now ask Kathleen if she would also like to announce the 2021 Tasmanian State Service Aspiring Leader Award. Mm -hmm. The winner of the TASPLAN International Women's Day Award for Excellence 2021 for aspirational leadership in the Tasmanian State Service is Lisa Baker. Lisa is a leader in the information management space in the Department of Education. Currently, her team provides support to government agencies requesting searches and disposals of records to assist with civil redress evidence requests as a result of the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. Her approach has provided both support and leadership to other state government agencies in dealing with the sensitivities associated with the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. Lisa's leadership is authentic, individualised and by example delivers what's achievable um, and the results required. Congratulations, Lisa. Hello. Can you can you hear me? You can. <laughs> okay. Um oh I'm so so honored to receive this award. So thank you very much, David, for nominating me and also for Taz Plan for the award itself. But I'd like to actually say I accept it proudly on behalf of my team as they've been instru inst instrumental in my success and thank them for their courage, bravery 
and professionally has been delivering excellent work in the area of institutional child sexual abuse. We are well supported by the Department of Education, which is now in a culture that has zero tolerance of any abuse of children or any person. So thank you very much. And I certainly will show that award out quite proudly. Thank you. Congratulations, Lisa. And now I'll hand over to Adrian for the Community Sector Industry Award. Thanks, Jenny. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. And I'd firstly like to congratulate the State Service winners. Your passion and commitment to providing leadership in your sector is really commendable. So well done and congratulations. Our task force is very pleased to be here today. It's a great honour actually to, um, to play a role in today's awards and for the opportunity to recognise the value and the long-standing contributions of women across the community services industry. Our industry employs 10,000 Tasmanians across the state, and this is roughly 80% of our workforce is women, are women, and that's something that we're very proud of. Women in the community services industry undertake a wide range of important roles, and today is about celebrating these achievements and recognising those women who go above and beyond. Now, on to the reason that we are here today, and that's to recognise our winners. First off is the category of Community Services Industry Inspirational Leader. The winner of the TASPLAN International Women's Day Award for Excellence 2021 for Inspirational Leadership in the Community Services Sector is Jamie Bledel. Jamie set out to establish new precincts for the arts, health and wellbeing. She identified a site and with the support of her board produced a working paper setting out a vision for St John's Park, Kick Arts Arts, I don't know if I said that quite right, Kickstart, Kickstart Arts, thank you, the wider arts and health communities and the general public. Through her passion, determination, highly developed organisational skills, ability to inspire and lots of work, almost all of that vision is now achieved. Jamie has been on an inspiration to the board, politicians, including ministers, three premiers, senior bureaucrats in the Tasmanian State Service, employees, artists and other practitioners, community service industry partners and community participants and sponsors. Congratulations. How's that? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. Um, as uh, somebody who has an organisation that is, uh, we kind of, uh, sometimes people have trouble understanding us as the community sector, although we absolutely are. And a big part of my change mission has been to bring an understanding of arts and creativity, particularly community arts and cultural development, which is the space we work in, into people's minds as being an important social service. Um, and so to win this is not just, it's not a win for me, it's a win for my whole organisation and for the sector in general, because it means that there's a starting to become a shared understanding of the importance of creativity and of collaboration in, in the change space and in the space of social justice. So I'm extremely honoured and I am absolutely thrilled. Um, thank you so much. Um, a couple of people I probably really do need to thank and I want to thank my team. So that's uh, Richard Bladel, Christian Florence, Steve McEntee, Richard Coburn, Caroline Amos. We work closely together. We're a very collaborative workplace. Um, board members past and present, especially our chair, Michael Fortescue, who shares a passion for the vision. He's been here through thick and thin for me and for all our staff. The partners we've worked with over the years from whom we've learned so much and we continue to learn to kickstart sponsors, the funding bodies and the peers who've demonstrated support for us 
to the ministers and the shadow ministers and their advisors and the senior bureaucrats who have gone into bat for the community arts and cultural development and for arts in general. There's still more work to do, but you know we've had some great support along the way. And all the artists and the community participants all around Tasmania who I've made art with and connected with over the past 15, 20 years to dream up a better future. Thank you so much. Oh, one more thing. If we can dream it, we can make it happen. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks also for the nice little tagline that we can all use. If we can dream it, we can make it happen. But you really are an inspirational leader and uh, your passion and dedication to the industry has certainly paid off. You know, I particularly note the work out there at um, establishing Kickstart Arts Centre and the St John's Creative Living Centre. I'm really looking forward to coming out and meeting with you and maybe bringing out your awards so we can really celebrate. But I think that the um, this quote really sums it up best from the nomination, which was, so through Jamie's passion, determination, highly developed organisational skills, ability to inspire and lots of hard work, almost all of that vision to establish a new precinct for arts, health and wellbeing has been achieved. So well done, congratulations. Um, and now on to our next award, which is the Community Services Industry Aspiring Leader Award. The winner of the Tasman International Women's Day Award for Excellence 2021 for aspirational leadership in the community services sector is Sari Lawson. Sari Lawson is known for her exceptional leadership skills and passion and for helping young people aged between 13 and 25 engage with their community. Sarah completely redesigned Launceston City Mission's Mish Maker program, creating courses around design, making and selling, as well as engaging more external facilitators to share their skills, experience and knowledge. Sarah is a writer and a disability advocate, mentoring several young women on the NDIS to increase their cap um, capacity for independence. Congratulations. Um, thank you so much. I would like to thank the Assistant City Mission, obviously, for having this amazing program, and um, and for consistently looking at my skill and my passion over my disability. It's so appreciated and letting me, giving me the creativity in the space to change the lives of some really awesome young people. And yeah, I guess that's kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you. Thank you for your role as um, for young women, the mentoring that you do, as well as the, your stewardship for the MISH program. It's really to be commended. And really looking forward to what the future holds um, for your leadership skills and where you, where you take them. And I thought this quote best summed up Sarai's achievements, and that's through her experience in establishing micro businesses of her own, Sarai has been able to take participants through branding, product curation, marketing, and the use of social media, all while helping them to build their social, their own self-confidence. So well done, Sarai, congratulations. And that wraps up the community services section of the awards. And once again, congratulations to the winners but also congratulations to the nominees. I mean, I think my fellow judges would agree that it was a, a such high caliber of nominees this year, made it a very challenging uh, thing to have to do to, 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 judge, to judge those awards, but also very rewarding. It's just so, so fantastic to hear so many examples of great leadership going on out, on out there across Tasmania. So congratulations. And I'd now like to hand over to Christine, Christina Homdahl, the president of LEGAT, to announce the Local Government Awards. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to congratulate all the, all the winners to date, um, outstanding women that are making a fabulous contribution to Tasmania. The International Women's Day TASPLAN Awards for Excellence offer the opportunity not only to raise awareness of the local government sector, but also to promote the outstanding work being achieved in our field. Legat works to protect the interests and rights of councils. We promote the efficient operation of local government. We foster strategic and collaborative relationships 
and we promote the positive role that Tasmanian uh, councils make in our communities. Our work frequently involves advocacy and engagement with state and federal governments on legislative and policy issues impacting and managed by councils, as well as promoting the positive work that councils deliver to their municipalities. We are a level of government closest to the people, and that's why today it's an important opportunity to hear the outstanding work from women in our sector that in turn support our communities. Statewide, we have over 260 elected representatives. In 2018, at our last local government elections, um, this resulted in approximately 28% of mayors being female and 23% of women across all elected members. So you'll see we've still got a long way to go uh, to raise equity in, in my sector. Being elected members carries huge responsibility they're not only seen as leaders in their communities, but they're also juggling family and careers, and yet they, they are driven to make where they live a better place. That is why recognising the work that they do today is hugely important, not only to recognise the successes with impacts for now, but to encourage future generations of women to become involved. I now wish to hand over to Kathleen to announce the winner of the Local Government Sector Inspirational Leader. Thank you, Kathleen. The winner of the Tasplan International Women's Day Award for Excellence 2021 for Inspirational Leadership by Local Government Elected Representative Award is Mayor Mary Knowles, Northern Midlands Council. <clears throat> Mary is a strong advocate for preventing violence against women, campaigning for a women's shelter to be located within the Northern Midlands. She is a Legat representative on the Family and Sexual Violence Consultative Group and continues to raise awareness and advocate to end violence against women. Mary is an active member of the community, not just restricted to the Northern Midlands, and donates her time attending community events and meetings to ensure the community is being heard on a local, state and federal level. Congratulations. Can you hear me? Okay. Wow. Um, total honour and privilege to accept this award. Um, I believe the council staff were the ones who actually nominated me, so huge thanks to them. As Christina said, um, local government is the closest level of government to the community and it encourages us um, working to work with the community in a really genuine way. And as, um, gosh, I'm losing it. <laughs> um, as Grace said, we need to um, change the culture behind the issues in our community. And we're in quite a privileged position in local government to be able to assist with some of that. And it is so important to stand up and speak out and, and choose to challenge the social norms of accepting covert bullying in our workplaces, the current norms, the current hidden issues, and which include grooming, child sexual assault, family violence, and victim blaming. I mean, it is up to all of us to, to stand up and, and we've just got to stop this and, and speak out on our issues, which is something that I've done, well, over lots and lots of years. But um, as a mayor, it was a very fine line choosing to speak out um, during the White Ribbon campaign, uh, but keep that personal and not interfere with my role as a mayor. Um, I feel the, the young reporter at the examiner did that very well. Um, and if it supports anybody in, in listening, taking on board what they can do to change what's happening, change the norm in their lives, um, that's what I'm hopefully <laughs> going to help to do. So I thank you very, very much. And um, yeah, thanks.
Good afternoon. On behalf of local government professionals Tasmania, what an absolute privilege it is for me to be here today to observe <coughs> firsthand so many wonderful Tasmanians being appropriately recognised for their significant achievements and contributions to make our society a great place to live in, work in, and of course, invest in. And look, I'm really, uh, really humbled to be here today and, and listen to Grace. Um, what a wonderful person. Um, she set the scene for so many of these awards and it now gives me great pleasure to introduce the inspirational leader, local government officer category. The winner of the TASPLAN International Women's Day Award for Excellence 2021 for inspirational leadership by local government officer is Karen Hampton, Devonport Council. Karen has provided outstanding leadership to guide Devonport Council's community services team in delivering events and services that resulted in substantial benefits to the community during COVID-19. Karen drove a revised funding approach with elected members to focus on small community events and social recovery actions to assist those members of the community who may have been vulnerable and struggling. Karen balanced a performance driven approach with a genuine empathy and concern for the community. And in doing so, she inspired her team and provided them with challenging and rewarding work. Congratulations. Well, such an honour. Um, I was feeling honoured to be nominated, let alone finalist. Um, this is very humbling. As a community services manager, the last 12 months have seen absolutely everything about my department turned upside down. We had to adjust, change and modify every single aspect of how we dealt with our communities by implementing various new initiatives with no idea of whether or not they would work. Unprecedented times indeed for local government and unlike anything I've experienced in 28 years of being in this sector. When I look back at what we achieved, however, I do feel a huge sense of pride in what my team were able to deliver to the Devonport community. That said, I certainly don't consider myself an inspirational leader and so to be the recipient of this award is um, quite overwhelming. I would like to thank sponsors TASPLAN, TASCOS, Legat, State Government and LG Professionals Tasmania, who have a very special place in my heart for supporting these awards, thus providing an opportunity for women to be recognised in their chosen careers. But I especially thank those who have been with me every step of my journey providing never-ending support and encouragement and always reminding me that I need to have faith in my ability and my decisions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'd like to once again congratulate all of those who were nominated. I think it was Christina or other uh, previous speakers who said that the judging decisions were very difficult. Uh, the quality of leadership uh, across our organisations is just amazing. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's such a pleasure to be involved with these uh, awards, the TASPLAN International Women's Day Leadership uh, awards for Excellence um, and have the opportunity to recognise and celebrate just some of the outstanding contributions and commitment that are made by women across our sectors. And it's really, um, I guess, instructing for me to see or uh, reaffirming, I think, for me to see that all of those contributions um, and of those recipients today within different contexts, in different roles, but all contributing in some way to support Tasmanians, mostly vulnerable Tasmanians, whether it's those affected by COVID 
um, or in family violence situations, um, you know, those who um, have uh, who are not as fortunate as others in the community. Every single one of our recipients is working to that end, and I think that's typical of the work that Tasmania or that women do. Um, and uh, and I again like to congratulate and thank you all uh, for the work uh, that you do. I uh, also note the humility um, in which um, our recipients received their awards today. And again, that's typical of the um, female contribution to leadership, um, not only in this state, but um, across the world, I imagine. So uh, congratulations again to our um, award recipients. Um, and I just remind you, it was Karen and Mary in the local government sector. Well done, uh, Sarai, Sarai, I hope that's right, Sarai and Jamie. Um, in the um, uh, community sector industries and um, uh, Lisa and Sophie for the Tasmanian State Service Awards. Thank you very much and congratulations again. Um, now, award recipients, we will be sending you your trophies and um, and your checks, um, uh, which is have been um, obviously kindly sponsored by uh, TASPLAN. Uh, in the coming days. Uh, we thank you again and we do hope that we will be able to get you together at some time soonish in the future so that we can um, take some photographs and um, have some media coverage of the awards today. So look out for emails in relation to that. Um, I'd like to once again thank Kathleen uh, Crawford and Taz Plan, who um, are soon to be Spirit Super, uh, who um, have um, uh, been uh, inaugural and continuing sponsors of this award, which is so important, I think, for women um, in uh, Tasmania. Um, uh, thank you to my sector colleagues um, for joining me today and for the, for the work that you've done in making these awards possible, and particularly also to the very hardworking team uh, that have worked to bring this virtual event uh, virtual event together. Um, our thanks to you especially. And I have to say, from where I'm looking, it's all gone very, very well, given that we've got more than 150 people um, on the other side of this screen. I think that uh, that's been a huge achievement. So congratulations. Now, of course, we all know that International Women's Day is not today, but it falls on the 8th of March, uh, which is Monday. Um, so I encourage you all to take a moment to reflect and consider how you too can choose to challenge, uh, to raise awareness about women's, inequality, uh, women's equality uh, and support the celebration of women's achievements locally, nationally and on a global scale. And again, I thank you all for sharing, uh, showing your interest by joining us today um, and wish you all the very best. Thank you.